been following fintech, subscribe to any newsletters or watch on Twitter or anything, the experts in the space that are always somehow seem to be ahead of the trend and writing smart things. Oh, look at that. Uh, writing smart things before any of us are even talking about it. It's this crew right here. So I'm super excited to dive in today, um, especially with so much going on in this space right now. One thing, you know, We've all been in FinTech for a while, and in 2020, 2021, there was a lot of just people hiring like crazy, launching new things like crazy, spending a lot of money in our newsletters. Uh, and it's been days. scaling back a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, they're like, it's yeah. It's very personal. <laughs> Remember the those days? <laughs> um, but they've been scaling back a lot lately, and I would just love to hear what you guys have been seeing on the scene. Simon, how about we start with you? Ooh, you Ooh. came straight to me, huh? Uh, so I, th I think it's no secret, and even since Money 2020 last year, everybody was saying, consumer fintech, what's your moat? Hmm. Right now, if you have an app and a card and you're monetizing through interchange revenue, guess what? So is everybody else. If you are targeting uh, high-risk, low FICO score consumers, no matter how well-intentioned you are, Where's your profit coming from? Do you have a fraud problem? Probably yes. So that place is not a nice place. So accordingly, they're doing product expansion. They're thinking about their infrastructure stack. They're looking at partnering. B2B is better. B2B is in better shape. Like it really is. They're business customers. But everyone there is concerned about operational resiliency. I don't know if you follow the news, but something happened in the banking sector recently. So, you know, a, a little bit of confidence or trust in the B2B space. But fintech companies, everybody from Mercury to Arc to Ramp, to, they're all competing now on how much FDIC insurance they have. Uh, and then the, probably the, the nicer spot to be, so consumer B2B uh, infrastructure. Actually, the infrastructure space, everybody wants better infrastructure. Everybody wants somebody who can prove unit economics. So that's actually probably the one place that's doing quite well. I'm, I'm interested in what the panel thinks, though. Disagree with me. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that uh, B2C FinTech right now, it's funny, I actually literally wrote this in my newsletter last night. Um, so, you, so funny you brought it up. Um, <laughs> B2C FinTech is not dead, OK? Yes, are there? Is the funding shifting more towards B2B? Yes, but honestly, the difference is 10%. And B2C FinTech for me is never dead until is every single person being served financial services in this world? I don't think so. So in fact, right now, when I talk to founders that are building in this space, they're the most excited to build right now, okay? What needs to happen is FinTech, consumer FinTechs need to solve the fundamental demands and financial needs of consumers. So we focus so much on investing, we focus so much on wealth management and the bells and whistles thinking, hey, everyone's got their emergency fund set, right? Wrong. Most Americans cannot cover a $400 emergency expense unless they borrow money. And guess what? A lot of those people can't borrow money because they don't have the credit score or the, the files to do so. So there is still so much room to grow in that space. And for us to just say, oh, well, we got to focus on B2B right now. No, now's the time. <laughs> now's the time to build in the hardest place. And are you resilient enough to do it? Are you resilient enough to do it without the fraud, without the things, and, and stretch your brain enough to figure it out? That's what I want to see. Do you mean being an entrepreneur is hard and you got to be a contrarian yeah. and yeah. you got to, oh, okay. Yeah, like you have to think differently about your metrics for success and you can't just replicate what someone else does. Yeah. Yeah, so from my point of view, I guess I see it from a VC point of view, but also I get to interview more later stage entrepreneurs and I think it's clear that right now, everyone is looking more for the B2B opportunities, right? And so funding is much harder to get as a B2C. But if you look at the numbers, it is true that a lot of B2Cs, they're growing like crazy, right? You just gotta know where to look. And we look at both the US, Canada, but also Latin America, and I think Focusing on Latin America, just for this answer, um, the growth there is, is extremely, extremely inspiring. Um, and I think the B2C thesis there is much stronger, uh, probably be because of a history of just weaker incumbents. 
who are are very comfortable. They have amazing returns of equity, returns on equity, and now you know you see fintech serving not even the base of the population, but the the bottom eighty percent, which is quite large. So. From our point of view, we we're not afraid to invest in consumer. We're doing it less. Uh, there's just more activity happening in B two B. And regardless whether you're talking about B two B or B two C, the the focus is on sustainable business models, which is easy to say, much harder to execute. But those who can, they're definitely getting getting the money these days. Lex, you're in pro you cover crypto, which is probably the most volatile of everything right now. <laughs> what have you been seeing? He's having the most fun. So f first question is, raise your hand if you can hear us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. For real, you, you, in the, over there, you can hear us okay. Because yeah. I can't because the speakers are facing this way. So I'm like, I feel like we're in a... In a um, in a You're block missing of, good stuff. I know. I, it's <laughs> like I should, if they could only write it down and email it to me so I could subscribe to it at fintechblueprint.com slash subscribe. I don't know. Wow. That, would be really, that would be really great. Um, I'm kidding. Um, not really, though. But, but you know. He's really it's, not. <laughs> Go subscribe right now. I'm not needy. You are. Shut up. Forget this panel. Subscribe to our newsletters, and you'll know exactly what we're about I'm to say. I'm surprised you didn't have them put the QR code as the background instead of the volcano. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was going to go here eventually. Um, look, I, I think we can kind of get into the weeds uh, in, in the crypto stuff. But for me, the most not I, interesting is the wrong word, but like the weirdest thing is just how fragile, like, um, sentiment is. You know, when you go through a market cycle, lots of things happen, and you can you can pay attention to different uh, to different symptoms that come out of that uh, market cycle. So, like, hey, the Fed broke all the banks. That's one symptom. Or, look, thirty or forty percent of the companies in crypto ended up um, being caught up in a fraud. Right? Like, these this is true. But you can also find things like, why is it that uh, a company like Dave, public, uh, you know, a fintech company called Dave, SPACed as a neobank, I'm sure we all have lots of feelings about it, you know, but if you look at their financials, they have literally linear revenue growth. Like, it's just, it's a straight line. Their revenue growth is a straight line, and their net income, you know, is kind of the neobank net income, so it's slightly unprofitable, it kind of wiggles down. Um, and yet, that thing is trading at 50 times revenue in 2021, and it's trading at like two and a half times revenue in 2023. And in 2021, everyone loves it. It's the future of the world. And in 2023, it's like never should have happened. All these things are wrong. You know, consumers aren't worth anything. So <laughs> to me, it's like I look at that information, I look at the market sentiment, and I basically just don't trust it. I think the information we're getting out of that market sentiment isn't particularly useful for people who are thinking about long-term horizons. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you're solving a question of, you know, how do you, you know, penetrate the, the uh, long tail of people who maybe are, aren't fundable in more traditional financial services, or if you're dealing with a question of um, how do we burn down the financial industry into nothing and rebuild it from scratch on decentralized open rails using open source software, you know, meanwhile taking down all of big tech and web two, you're not going to get an answer to that in two to three years by trading NFTs. So to me, like we are <laughs> caught up in a, it's, you, you think it's a joke, but. Um, He's right. So you're not going to get there in, in a couple of years and you're, you can't really extract that much meaning from the stories that the market is telling you because they're just kind of like echo chamber reflections of messaging from the Fed back to the banks to the big tech companies and it all kind of just amplifies up and down. You know, so for me, I'm, I'm as bullish as ever on um, the fundamental technology changes like um, Web3 and crypto has never had as many software developers building open source software financial and otherwise than it does now. There's never been more active accounts. You know, um, we get excited about fintechs having two million active accounts. Ethereum plus all the stuff attached to it has like 500 million addresses. You know, so um, even though things are volatile, 
I try not to kind of park my emotions into that volatility. So given all this, how, how healthy is the industry right now? Miguel? There's no, there's no one single answer. I guess you got to zoom in company per company or segment per segment. But, you know, the reality is that of all the companies that went public, let's talk about the public markets of fintech, we really haven't seen any blowouts, right? Like the companies, as Lex just mentioned, even those that have been hammered, like Dave or others, they're, they're still around. And, and oftentimes, more often than not, they're growing, right? And, and just, I don't know if you guys caught um, Nigel's presentation just now, but I think the direction of travel is very clear. The growth is there for the taking, right? Consumers definitely want a better experience. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's just about focusing on, on the basic unit economics, right? And then building something that is sustainable. But overall, I'd say, you know, the industry is, is healthy, but, but has some challenges. And how, how much harder is it to do that now versus back in 2020 and 2021 when you could raise so much funding and you felt like you had more flexibility to explore different things and truly find out what the consumer might value most, whereas now you've got to be super focused and don't really have that wiggle room anymore, especially if you haven't raised in a year or two and you're going to have to start thinking about that again. I think they say that necessity is the mother of all innovation. <laughs> and, and people forget that just a few years ago, you know, a decade ago, some of the best companies, they started with little capital and they had to be creative and figure it out. So it's, of course, easy to say on a panel, but it's going to be a blessing for a lot of these companies to we have, are so blessed yeah, right yeah. now. I, Hashtag blessed. It oh. doesn't feel like it, but it's a forcing no, function to grow up. But absolutely, <laughs> it, it, it's forcing you to rethink how you spend your money, right? Mm -hmm. And then whether this is a, a real necessary investment that's going to propel the company into never having to raise capital again, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, again, very easy to say from this comfortable seat but, but just yeah, to add to that yeah like, it, what if that's healthy though right go ahead the the ability to hire 10 people and spend two million dollars to just build it has gone away yeah. and so it's forcing a different <laughs> decision making process because yeah you and for the companies that spent the two million dollars and did just build it they probably did an amazing job but guess what now you got to maintain it yeah. because the world outside your window doesn't stay static customers have new demand uh regulators want new things fraud changes compliance are like ah and so you can build it, but can you maintain it? And can you do it best in class? And so I think that's the thesis behind why the infrastructure companies have done well, but they're now moving upstream into enterprise fintech. And as they move upstream into enterprise fintech, talking to your point earlier, they're also moving into a lot of the banks. I was speaking to uh, Matt Van Butnik from Hummingbird. Most of his clients now are the top 10 banks starting to use a regtech, a rinky dink reg tech solution that didn't exist five years ago. So I think that is the the big shift of like who provides and, and who can who can make a difference for you. It's not banks versus fintech quite as severely anymore. Mm. And to Lex's point, isn't it interesting that we haven't seen the big public blow-ups? Yes, but who did blow up? And who's got operational resiliency? And that's that's the most important thing. And that's the reason we're all here is not just to help people get onto the ladder, but to protect the money when they do. Trust is everything. Everything right you, now. As soon as you lose that, you are out of luck. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at the culture of the demographics that we're looking at right now. So remember that Gen Zs and Millennials make up nearly 50% of the population today. They're inheriting over $300 billion in wealth every month like it's happening so fast and right before our eyes and if we're not paying attention to what the culture is wanting which is trust right it's why a lot of us of us exist i exist because people follow people instead of institutions 
And that's how I've built any kind of credibility by being honest and open and saying, hey, like, there's so much pessimism in the, in, the, in the market, but this is the most important time to be optimistic and aspirational. This is the time to like, forget all the sticky notes you put on the whiteboard and build something entirely new. I actually would be curious what Lex's thoughts are on the crypto space and kind of having that almost a rewrite of the narrative because it got a little wild and crazy there, didn't it? Like, there's a lot going on. It's almost like what is healthy is maybe a, re like a little bit of a reconfiguration. Maybe healthy is taking the, you know, the, the old and trying something new. And, and that, the market kind of forced us into this space. But I do think that that's healthy. And rethinking, OK, well, we've made a lot of investing apps. We built a lot of products. Maybe instead of building more products on top of our products to give more things to consumers, maybe instead we think about Plaid's 2022 uh, FinTech Effect report saying that what do consumers demand the most from their FinTech apps? They want, number one, how to build an emergency savings fund. Holy crap. Yes. Number two, how to find their credit score and build their credit score and maintain it. The third one is how to build a savings habit. They want the, their behaviors to change. There is so much opportunity to explore there. We have barely scratched that surface. We're like, oh my gosh, we made like a button in an app where they can instantly do that. No, like how are you actually changing the psychological nature of how people are interacting with our industry. That's where I think so much growth is. Behavioral economics. I, yeah. I think people hate financial products. Yeah, I don't totally. think we'll ever get around that. <laughs> I mean, um, if I pick anybody out of the audience and say, um, your bank just called, uh, your mortgage is in trouble, you have to refinance by Friday, uh, can you come into the branch please and see your lending officer? And um, uh, there's two or three appointments, so we're going to need you to, you know, take some time off work. Can you get your paperwork in order? How many people feel really good about hearing that message? <laughs> uh, or, you know, anybody have, anybody have student loans? You know, how fun is that? That's pretty good. Or maybe your investment account, it always goes up and gives you happy charts, right? Mm -hmm. People hate financial products, which is why you have to bribe them $500 to even sign up for your horrible <laughs> financial company, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the sort of uh, shocking version of the statement. So the question is, can, is there anything that addresses that or changes that? And I think that um, a lot of the first wave fintech companies did try that by lowering the friction of interaction, right? So it's much more of a pleasure to interact with um, a mobile fintech product. It sucks less. It sucks less. It's and, more of a pleasure. Yeah. I like that. But it's also full of drugs. It's full of dopamine. Yeah, yeah. totally. Right? That's how we made it better is we put cocaine into trading. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's really, sugar, really great sugar? now. I think it's been replaced by Adderall. Uh, I'm, I'm trying really hard to like get your attention. I don't know if it's working. That's uh, why the drug reference. It's working. Yeah. So, so the second answer is other than making the distribution and interaction of it more pleasurable and fun and easy and all that, is there something you can do to the actual financial products knowing what we do about human nature, which is nobody wants to learn about investing. They want the investing to be done for them and to yeah. be good. Nobody wants to apply for a loan. They want the money so they can live their life. So, so for me, that's the, that's the kind of next leg of what crypto is there for. You know, and I, I hate to quote Wealthfront. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, well, you know, I feel like temperature drops and like a hissing sound comes out if I say Wealthfront three times. <laughs> um, is that, that's not funny to anyone other than the people on this panel. OK. Um, Damn. <laughs> this is the first day. You think how much trouble I'm going to get you into later. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like you know, they, they said that they, they coined the term self-driving money. And um, I think it was kind of an attempt in the self-driving car era to, to latch onto it, but I think it's a fantastic concept. Because if people want outcomes, they do want self-driving money, right? I don't want an asset allocation. I want my money to put itself into an asset allocation, align itself against all my goals and my search intent without me ever having touched it, because I've put all my stuff into Google and other places already. And then for it to form and achieve those goals on my behalf on its own. So when we're in a world of you know, uh, generative AI and automation agents and all of these rules are open source and obvious, when we have you know, giant scaled uh, networks 
that can compute software for us. You know, so the most important thing in crypto right now is that um, scalability works. We can process thousands of transactions. You've got rollups that work. You have privacy coming online. All of that stuff is there. So once you have money that is able to behave on people's behalf without being micromanaged, once you take away from people that sort of um, uh, emotional weight of having to deal, it, deal with it, whether that's done by a human being or by a smart agent, I think we're, we are going to get into a place where people will feel much better about saying, how do I save, how do I invest, how do I, how do I borrow money? The, the right answer for asset allocation is known, no matter where you are on the phone. <laughs> no, like, for most people, most of the time, it is 60-40 you know, portfolio, <laughs> save every month, build a rainy day fund. Like, there's literally a flow chart on Reddit. Like, this stuff is known. It's not rocket science. What people buy from a private wealth manager is empathy. Mm -hmm. They want to be heard. That's what you're really getting. And that human emotion side is the behavioral psychology yeah. you were talking about that we haven't scratched the surface yep. on. Financial services has an engagement problem. It is not engaging. I think this is why embedded finance took off because those products are right. engaging. Yeah. They have a revenue problem historically. Financial services does not have a revenue problem. Actually, it's a great way to juice revenue for if you're Shopify or somebody else through things like payments. So those two kind of come together. It's Brett King's been talking for half a decade about invisible banking. That's kind of what he means is the finance has to go away, but it has to just show up. The thread that you got me thinking about though, Lex, was uh, behavioral psychology and game design are kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you listen to Rahul Vora, um, who's the founder of the Superhuman email app, he did a couple of podcasts on Invest Like the Best. If you want to go down this rabbit hole, listen to both of those and his interviews on 20 Minute VC. It's a masterclass in taking game design and using those mechanics that get people addicted to that online game, to swiping on Candy Crush, those dynamics, because the best game design doesn't teach you how to play the game in a classroom sense. You learn it by doing, and it builds those reward centers. That is the best app design, except here's an actually good reason to do it. I'm, I'm teaching you how to have a savings habit without teaching you. Mm -hmm. I'm just designing the experience so beautifully. Th to your point, Nicole, that is so far away from where we are, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah, we're, we're not even, it's because, and I think it's a, it's a mind shift set uh, shift as well, right? So we do have to think about um, yes to all of these points, but also what does that next generation or current really, right? The trust? younger gen, what do they trust? What do they want? They want value. They want community. They want to feel like they're large. They're a part of something larger than themselves, and they do want that in their financial services. Whether it's not like, ooh, I'm so excited to be a part of my bank's community. That's like not the mindset. <laughs> what it is is looking at someone and saying. Take the personal finance influencers out there, you know, on social media. To me, they've actually kind of hit a wall. They've hit a wall where they've done a great job of, of, of showing what financial literacy is, what, what uh, technology can do, but they don't really go any more past, uh, these are the basics, basic fundamentals of personal finance, and this is an app I like to use. But they don't actually show you anything about the app. They don't actually, like, because they're just sponsored, right? I mean, and look, like, nothing wrong with being sponsored. Like, sponsor me. Um, but, like, but, <laughs> but, like, they just don't actually show you. They're just, like, use SoFi, and then that's it. But, like, I would, this generation wants to know, okay, well, who's leading SoFi? What are they about? What are they, you know, what are your morals? So far, I mean, it sounds crazy, but they want to know that. Um, and then they want to know if, like, are their peers willing to do it? Are there, like, is a community going to be there for them? Is there someone there that they can, like, talk to about whatever is going on in their mind psych psychologically when it comes to money? And if that stuff's not in place, then, you know, customers are really fickle right now, right? Like loyalty only comes with that trust. And the way a bank historically communicated, the way regulators want you to communicate, don't jive with the authenticity required mm. of a creator. And, and I think that authenticity is something that's just completely different. And I think you can authentically be a banker, right? Like, but be yeah. authentic. <laughs> right. um, don't, don't try and be a TikTok influencer as a banker, but I think there's yeah. really something to pull on there. Right, and I think that we as leaders in the fintech space have this, what I, in my opinion, almost a responsibility, 
You know, if people know how to talk about our industry and how to actually, you know, the, the, what's actually going on in our apps and how we're actually building it, like, this is, it is no longer the era of if you build it, they will come. That is not a thing anymore. Just like, I feel, I would say, erase it from your minds. What is actually happening now is that you have to build the ship and then you have to tell the story of building the ship. Mm -hmm. So, Nicole, do you think uh, that current Gen Z, let's focus on Gen Z consumers, are going to be more loyal to their financial institutions? Because one of the things that old school bankers mm. will always tell you is never overestimate the loyalty of your customers. Yeah. Right? Sticky deposits, maybe. Do you think that's, <laughs> that's going to change in this new generation? Um, I think it can with the rise of fintech apps being more focused on community elements, being more focused on adding value with their content, and maybe not just curating content, right? So how are you actually providing education? How are you actually connecting a user to a community of like-minded people? How are you gathering them together in the same room? Honestly, Humans are more uh, lonely than ever before, right? So 60% of uh, humans are reporting that they are identifying as lonely. That's a, that's a, that's a large significant uh, portion of the population and it's kind of sad, right? But what's the antidote to loneliness? Subscribing to a newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> Joining my community. Um, no, <laughs> community. <laughs> community, that. But, so, Subscribing to a newsletter can be the literal first step, right? Joining a, um, you know, a fintech app or an investing app that you resonate with the founder's story because you saw them on TikTok or Instagram. Like, that's the beginning stages. And then how are you going as like the operator, as the leader in fintech, how are you going to talk to that audience? How are you going to communicate with them at scale, right? I don't think that we should be the only people with you know, creating content for this audience. I think that every single person building should be doing it too because I believe in building the ship and telling the story. So yeah. if I, I can, I'm going to take the opposite view just for fun. Okay. Um, so I think what you're describing is kind of distribution, or you're describing um, how to do distribution more cheaply, uh, yeah. right? Like how to day trade attention and maybe how to have retention and engagement of customers. Whereas I think we're, we're entering like um, uh, an era of machine money, where your money is robots and your robots are financial. Like there's, there's lots of symptoms of that kind of happening. And, and what that does is it makes capital much more mercenary than ever before. And Silicon Valley Bank is exactly the, you know, it's, it's the perfect example that like, hey, uh, built for venture capitalists forever and ever, and also the moment they want to betray you, they do it all at once and you're dead, right? So. Yeah. I th and if you look in the crypto space, mercenary capital is the crypto space. Like, if I don't like Ave for any reason, like the CEO tweeted a thing that I th made me feel bad, uh, unsubscribe, take out all my money, move it to a, f a complete copy, and and sit, put it into Compound in a day. Right? If everyone decides we're going to destroy that protocol, all the money will move out. You think you have three billion? You don't. You have nothing. Right? In a in a flash. Right? And that's on purpose, that's enabled by automating all the infrastructure all the way down from the, the bank interface or the deposit interface all the way through whatever the equivalent is to your Gort banking system to custody and settlement and all of it on the payment rails. And I think that's happening everywhere. I'm, I'm more on Lex's side in this case. I think technology is definitely nice. evolving and we're getting better experiences, more digital money, digital services for sure. But I think human nature is going to be the same for, for generations to come. Maybe now um, Gen Z and even millennials are younger, but I think as people get older, they get more cynical. Um, millennials and, and, are not that young. Yeah, and, and, and I would say <laughs> for Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, this is a big debate, but I wouldn't call founders betraying as we be when they take their money out. They, are, they were protecting their company's interest. That's not a betrayal. That's taking care of your, of your customers, of your investors, of your shareholders, of yourself. Yeah, a, a bank run is a race and you have to win it. It's not a betrayal. Huh? <laughs> speaking, speaking of bank what? runs though, um, FedNow is imminent. It's going to happen any week now. And that's just going to increase the number of payments that can happen very, very quickly, if not instantly. How does that impact bank runs in the future? We've already seen what social media does to bank runs in the future. 
Simon. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine. Hey, you uh, work at a payments company. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, well, so, yeah. First of all, more rails equals more problems. Um, so, old <laughs> rails don't die. It's like sedimentary rock. Like, ACH is not going to disappear. RTP is not going to disappear. Zell is not going to disappear. Cash App is not going to disappear. So, like, you've got a lot of multi... Uh, you've got a multi-rail environment already. You've got RTP already. So the adoption there is an interesting question and what, what, what does it kind of displace? But I think the first order effect is everything is real-time and real-time default, but most fraud and compliance is batch, especially at the big banks. So the faster payments equals faster fraud straight away. The, the, the first beneficiary is absolutely those guys, even though the... You assume that like it adds to GDP. There was a great study uh, by the UK Payments Council that said in the first 15 years of real-time payments in the United Kingdom, they attributed 2% of GDP to the existence of faster payments. I mean, that that's massive for the whole economy. What does that mean for your business? Now, yeah, I would want to go read that study too. I see you laughing. No, no, just I'm just thinking about UK GDP growth, you know? It's like, uh, which, and that's, you like that's a that? really big part of UK <laughs> GDP. Look, it's a nice place to live. You live there for a reason. Um, <laughs> God save the king now. You know? Yeah, oh God. Uh, also, uh, I, wanna, I just want to take a moment to apologize to Adam Nash of Wealthfront, with whom I've had a fantastic <laughs> podcast. It's really oh my. nice, really... <laughs> So yeah, real-time payments means Lex probably has to move back to America and the king <laughs> will kick him out. Um, but I think the first order effect is that. The second order effect is, um, you know, like consumer choice starts to get overwhelming. Like which yeah. app do I use? Oh my gosh. What, pro like I can't Venmo to you, but my mom tried to sell it to me and what do I pay this bill with? And now there's a QR code for Apple Pay and like, ah, uh, like this is starting to become like a real nightmare. It's funny, um, in the early days of uh, actual rails, there was a whole bunch in the UK and the US, bunch of private companies build independent railroads. Uh, and they all end up really unprofitable by the 1930s. So what happens? The government comes in, takes over, smushes them all together, and grinds out a profit, and then private companies come and take back over. And that, I suspect, is going to be harder to do in financial services because there's regulatory capture, there's vested interests. But I think this is where the networks, the visas, the MasterCards, this is where the people who actually set the rules, like the signaling of the rails, will have a role to play because this stuff's going to have to work together. We can't just have that checkout in hell where I get to check out and there's 15 buttons forever. That's just, that's just sucks. I think we have some examples around the world where government-sponsored payment rails are really working. Yep. And that's India and Brazil, and probably Brazil being the most notorious one in recent, their last couple of years. And it, the reason it's worked is because they aligned the incentives correctly. Bullseye. And they used their power, the central bank's regulatory power, to oblige, to make sure that every meaningful financial institution actually placed a button that was easy to find. Yeah. And that just encouraged... Can you like, imagine the Fed doing that? Not really. Yeah. And that, that kind of... Like UPI, another thing. Uh, central bank obliges everybody and they've got baked in digital identity from the government. Like, I, I think I've seen a lot of people say that... Um, Fed now is the UPI or the PICS moment for the United States. Nuh-uh. No. 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 Because it, not unless TCH goes away. Not unless... I mean, do you see what Visa just did with Venmo, with Visa Plus? Like, why would I, as a very small bank, want to push Fed now and destroy other sources of revenue um, when there's TCH out there that I'm locked out of to some extent? Like, the incentives. Incentives matter. Mm. Thoughts? Nicole, how do you think that impacts consumers? Because those people that you know need four hundred dollars to cover an emergency expense, if they can't get something instantly, or they try to, and there's fraud behind the scenes or something that makes their outcome even worse, like how do you see that going moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think Simon said it best when he said that collaboration is is a necessity in this 
in this, in this case and, well, across the board. Um, when it comes to something like fraud, I mean, the bad actors, is that what we're calling them these days? Anyways, they are literally working together all of the time. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> like John Travolta. Yes, him. Um, <laughs> what? Anyways, uh. that guy. Um, but the, the bad actors are working together all the time, so how are the good guys going to come together and, and you know, advocate for... For that consumer, we're still laughing about this. Uh, sorry, I'm still enjoying bad actors, John Travolta. Yeah, I don't know why <laughs> I'm trolling when he went our own panel. That, like, that come doesn't... on. What did John Travolta do? Yeah. Well, anyway. I'll, I'll troll Lex a little bit here. Uh, you know, sorry. last year Peter told me that there's a lot of companies that submitted something crypto related, um, including fintech companies wanting to talk about crypto. This year they didn't get any fintech companies that wanted to talk about crypto. That's wild. Isn't it? Is that a question or an observation? It's an observation, <laughs> and I want to know your thoughts on it. What 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 does fintech blueprint subscribe have yeah, to yeah. say? Yeah, yeah. So I I've, I this this is a personal challenge actually because I started my career at Lehman Brothers on Wall Street, um, and then so you get into the finance community, and then um, I start then I founded a, a robo advisor, and so I was in the digital wealth RAA community, and that's a very specific uh, point of view about the world, about the fiduciary <laughs> duty. Um, and then I transitioned into the UK fintech community. And by the way, in the UK, you know, people don't invest money. They just, they put money into the high bank uh, mm. and the bank is fancy and investment managers are kind of icky. It's the opposite in the US where investment managers are fancy and I won't say the opposite. Uh, and then the, the last bit is I've gone into the crypto community and, and uh, I work at Consensus, one of the, one of the core companies that's uh, building digital wallets in the space and building infrastructure. And it's, it's very strange to me because for me, it's like there's a continuation of different technologies being applied to pretty timeless financial motions. You know, like I need to pay, I need to pay you with cash, or I need to pay you with a card, or I need to pay you with a QR code, or I need to pay you with my phone. Like these are just things that I have, a, I have demand for that. As a consumer, I don't care what method I use whether it's using a stable coin or if it's using a piece of credit or if it's using a check. But the communities that are building these things are so, so different, you know, and they have such different values. And so I think that um, in the way that big financial services companies, when they had to invest in fintech and have innovation budgets and um, tell Wall Street that tech was really important, that was a stretch. It was hard to say that, yeah, you know, these tech companies, um, they can do some things better than us. And I think for the fintech community, it's the same relationship to crypto, where you're like, I'm still focused on just getting people to buy stocks or doing payments better. It's not really core to me to think about how to do decentralized finance or, or how to incorporate tokens into my offering or, you know, should my cash app render NFTs. That's not what my customers care about. And so because that's not what my customers are asking, I'm not going to answer their, you know, I'm not going to pretend they're giving me a question and give them some solution to a problem they don't have. Mm. And so fintech companies are acting exactly the same way towards crypto that banks were acting towards yeah. fintech, which is basically this kind of platform shift generational disconnect. Um, when I look into the Web3 ecosystem, again, for me, I see a, a ton of economic activity. I see uh, new types of businesses and business structures being created, right? So um, when people join and contribute labor to decentralized autonomous organizations, those are kind of like small businesses. So crypto has a small business sector. That small business sector has financial infrastructure. They're not going to bank with... Uh, well, they might have to, but they don't want to bank with uh, a traditional bank and they don't want to bank with a Brex or with a Web 2.0 fintech. They want to use DeFi solutions because that's their banking industry. And so, unfortunately, it feels like in times of stress, everybody's focused on their own core competence and, and yeah. their own problems. In times of, you know, money's flush, that's when you start building bridges and integrations and you, mm. you try to... Um, paint with a much broader brush, but, well, when, but I do think there's this divide. When now, and I, I love that you bring that up, something about just the crypto space generally, I'm like so not into this divisive nature. It either feels like you're all the way crypto and you're, or you're all the way not. And yeah, it's like- which 
tribe in crypto. I, yeah, okay. And then you got to pick whichever. Look, like, I'm shocked to hear that no one wanted to pitch a piece of content to talk about crypto at this event when now is the best time to rewrite the narrative of crypto. What in the... Yeah, like... This I've never is, been more excited. I know. I mean, I'm like, and honestly, even as myself, I'm like kind of hanging back, seeing what's going on. But man, I've never, like, I've never been more excited because to Lex's point, when like the world kind of started to go from, yay, everyone has money to, ooh, I think everyone's not going to have money. And we were still like excited about Bored Ape NFTs. I was like, ooh, we've lost the direction here. Like we're not really paying attention back to fundamentals. And so now we're here rewriting the narrative. You know what I would love to see? And feel free to pitch this to me. I have a podcast. It's called Humans of Fintech since we're plugging here. And I would love to see the day of someone coming in and being like, you know what? Yeah, the hula hoops and the board apes and the, the yacht clubs and the things needed to maybe take a break. And we need to go back to the fundamental reason why crypto became a thing to begin with or why blockchain technology became a thing to begin with, which was to increase the capability of global financial inclusion and to help more people access this financial system. It's happening across the globe. And like I said, we just got a little lost and carried away uh, well, here. And, and that's the thing everybody forgets is most, a big percentage of the users outside of the US, in fact, the vast majority are in the global south. It's mm -hmm. Latin America, it's Africa, Africa it's yeah. Asia Pacific. That's where the use cases are. There's a reason the UN is using stable coins, but you're not hearing about it. There's a reason that this is, because it works. Like this stuff actually works. Now to Lex's point- And that point, doesn't I, make the news. It doesn't make the news. <laughs> a person works hard and does something useful isn't a great headline. Right. I would not get clicks for that on fintechbrainfood.com forward slash subscribe. Uh, and, I do it anyway and just hope for the best. <laughs> and, and so that's it. It's, it's always one for me, one for the clicks. That's, right. that, that's, how it, that's how we run it. But I want to challenge Lex on, on one point. I do think that that crypto view of we've built this parallel global financial system is true, it's correct. It is a parallel global financial system and we forget that it is running in parallel quite a lot. But I don't think it obviates, therefore this system can never touch the old one. In fact, yeah. if anything, there are a lot of lessons to take from the old system to bring into the new one. The old system isn't global, it was globalized, right? So you have domestic networks that are like smudged together with this thing called Swift that doesn't really work and these other <laughs> networks. And then you have more rails, more problems. It's not really uh, digital, it was digitized. It's always a paper process. And somebody took the paper process and then added a little bit of digital and added a little bit more and then put a mobile screen on top of it. So the whole financial services infrastructure stack looks like sedimentary rock of like the decade of technology that existed. This parallel one, it's real time, it's 24 seven, it's programmable. And the best part is it's composable. So like imagine if your friends at Wealthfront built a feature we are very good friends. They were very good <laughs> friends at Wellfront. But you wanted to also have that feature from Robinhood that they just launched. There's no way to get those two things together in FinTech without signing up for both of those apps and going through KYC. In DeFi, if I want to use Compound and Aave, I can. If I, as a developer, want to connect those two with a bit of software, I can. And people forget that this is just going to unleash so much capability. And the people I talk to in Wall Street, in London, really deep inside the banks that are making the technology decisions absolutely get that. And they want to get there too. They just can't figure out how to make it all comply with the weight of rules that they have. But if we ever had an example as to why we need somebody that's not just the mercenary market, it's probably the last 12 months. Like sometimes the government and or somebody else can be very, very helpful when stuff goes wrong. So maybe there are some lessons in the old system that those folks don't know. That they might not want, but they might want something like it in this global mm. financial system. And I will get off my soapbox, because you can find <laughs> out more if you subscribe. <laughs> uh, last question, since we're on the topic of crypto, and I love hearing Lex talk. Um, this last question. What about DeFi? That seems like a space that's actually done quite well and almost proven itself mm -hmm. a bit over the last 12 months with everything going on. Yeah, you, I, I, I'm kind of holding back from 
doing like the blockchain DeFi pitch or Web3 pitch. Because, because don't of the, hold back. Uh, <laughs> go so, for it, so Midas. Contrarian three? now. Yeah. Lex, hold back. No. You, you can. You were contrarian now. Like it's yes. totally okay. Yeah. I remember writing um, about Web three. So I, you know, I don't feel particularly challenged, Simon, by your challenge because I agree with it. Um, I know it's awful. No. I, hate I came it. at the king and I missed. Uh, hate it. <laughs> so I, I think it is a really great example of I'm a developer. There's a part of Robinhood I like. There's a part of Lending Club I like. There's actually a nice yield account that's sitting in Apple right now. I don't know if you know about it. By I don't know how they did it. Um, Goldman Sachs. Uh, and you know I like these three things. And I want to hack together a robot that um, if I have a 15% profit in my Robinhood trading strategy, I withdraw 8%. Uh, and half of it I send to Lending Club for 10% yield, and the other half I put into the Goldman account. And then, you know, every month I need 500 bucks to pay my subscription, so put it into another account. I just want to hack that together, and I never want to talk to a human being or a company because I hate them all, right? I just, I just sit in my house and I code all day, and that's my whole personality, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so am I selling DeFi yet? Uh, is it working? Um, <laughs> For the and introverts. so, like to to a, you know to anybody in the financial industry, it's like you start imagining okay, uh, all the API documents, and then you start imagining the the enterprise documents, and also then you're like, but what about the consumer data? It's my data, and then I don't want to share my logins, and I don't want to, you know, and then you're like, and the regulators? Well, there's three regulators for this thing, and then two regulators for this thing, but we're in this state and not this state, so we have a different thing. And also, we have this exemption going on, so we have to pay for it. And by the way, who are you? You're 15 years old, and are you KYC'd? You know, like, what do your parents say? Um, <laughs> so, obviously, that doesn't work. In DeFi, what I've described is trivial to do. It is trivial to do. You go on the internet, you read a thing, and then you do it, and you build it, and that's it. And that's a robot that you've built. And by the way, if it's a good robot, millions of other people can use it for their own advantage if they want to. Or if it's not a good robot, mercenary capital is going to come and break it and kill it, and that robot will be hacked, and it will be dead. right? And so you take that evolutionary pressure, and you, you apply it in a market venue of a decentralized programmable blockchain. Um, and you've got the, the speed of development. You know, if banks develop at 1x and fintech develops at 10x, then DeFi and Web3 develops at 100x or 1,000x because of the type of um, environment that it's in. And so solutions evolve much faster. And the distinctions that we have between these different asset classes and between all this paper and stuff, it just, it, it, you, can, you can see how irrelevant and uninteresting and unnecessary it is. And that most of it is created as you know, an outcome of trying to build things based on very different architecture. Um, that doesn't mean human nature changes. That doesn't mean there aren't people who are going to perpetrate gigantic fraud. But you can perpetrate fraud using technology or uh, you know, ma made off like uh, photocopied fake, uh, fake returns and crumpled them up and gave them to the SEC during the SEC audit. Like You can do fraud in lots of different ways. Um, Tell me more let me tell about you. this fraud thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I think the, yeah. the industry, the DeFi crypto industry, I think it recognizes that old concepts matter. Mm. Like if, if you looked at hmm. the credit departments of any of the big crypto companies that were actually providing credit, not in fiat, you know, in cryptocurrency, most of those departments were com comprised of people with credit experience. Banker backgrounds. Yes, exactly. They're all former bankers turned, you know, crypto maximalists in some cases or, or close to. But, um, but they were using concepts from before, highly collateralized loans, you know. And, and, um, and also, as a, another example that just came to mind, last week I was talking to the person in the Central Bank of Brazil, going back, taking you back south. Uh, they are working on the digital react, yeah. right? And I think that's going to be uh, super, CBDCs. yeah. Well, but, but this is the thing. <laughs> they are not skipping banks. It's not going to be the CBDC that everyone's afraid of, that is the 
central bank going directly to consumer. No, they're going to work with the existing system, right, for distribution and for other things. So, do you know what's crazy to me? Every time I do a, 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 a talk to a C-suite of a bank or whoever, and I take them through all of the CBDC projects, they're like, oh wow, so that's real? It's like, yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's happening. This stuff's coming. It, it feels like it's so far away and it's ephemeral and it's not going to happen. And then you show them you know, what Stripe just did or what Sardine just did or what uh, just happened with the latest whatever. And people just, if you're in the C-suite of something, you've got a million things going on and you can't keep up. And it surprises people how real a, a lot of this development's becoming. Yeah. If you are in the C-suite and if you'd like to keep up. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> I like that you brought the collaborative nature of it as well. Kind of, kind of back to that, especially with the banks. I mean, uh, there's some of my you know, other favorite newsletters out there, you know, folks that aren't with us. Uh, and, and Alex Johnson you know, at FinTech Takes, one of my favorite things that he'll do is be like, you know, oh, it, we could just be like, burn down the banks. But like, no, 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 we can't do that, actually. Because, you know, whether it's crypto or whatever, because... At the end of the day, if you do that, you actually make it far worse for a whole lot of other people that only work and bank with the banks. So we can't just do that, but I do think it's, a, it's finding the balance of how do we work with the traditional structures that are already there and how do we kind of build either on top of them or help kind of change the foundation of what's going on. And that's what I think is so tricky for our industry is that we do have to rely on that collaboration um, no matter what we're doing and, and crypto is definitely feeling that. Uh, you guys backstage were skeptical that we could fill an hour, and I just laughed because we did it, and I think you forgot who you are filling an hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you asked us about crypto. What, and then, five I mean. minutes of that was promoting your own newsletters, but yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. What, Speaking what of which, let's, we'll go down the line, go ahead and say what your newsletter is in case anyone wants to describe, which you should. Sure. Nicole. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Nicole Kasperson. I am the founder and writer of FinTech is Femme. It is a newsletter, media company, podcast events, the whole thing. Um, dedicated to upholding our industry's promise of financial inclusivity by elevating the stories of women and diverse leaders. So if you're interested in financial inclusivity, if you're interested in how we can work more towards that and understanding more of the culture of our industry. And also if you're a badass woman or ally in the space that wants to be a part of a, a dope community of people that are dedicated to helping each other succeed, check my stuff out. Diamond. Uh, fintechbrainfood.com, you'll find all of the newsletters and rants and everything else. I have a day job, I work at Sardine, the world's best fraud and compliance platform. Come come hang out with us, we're, we're here all week. And if you wanna get rid of fraud and you've got some uh, AML things and you want all that to be better, you should talk to us. So I, I wear two hats, one a general partner, a co-founder of Gilgamesh Ventures. We invest in fintech in the Americas, so that's US, Canada and Latin America. And then the second hat is a FinTech Leaders newsletter slash podcast. You can find us on all the platforms you can think of, starting with Substack. Um, and it's interviews one-on-one -on -one usually with some of the most interesting FinTech leaders around the world, not, not just one single region. In case you weren't aware. <laughs> there's, there's so many newsletters and podcasts, if only there was some sort of aggregation of it all, you know, some sort of fintech, I don't know, nexus uh, <laughs> that could bring it all together. That would be amazing. Weird. <laughs> I'd love it. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next innovation. Yeah. Fintech nexus, love it. Dot com. <laughs> Go buy that URL. Uh, yeah. Uh, if, if you're interested in, in my newsletter, it's fintech blueprint. Uh, and then uh, for some of the crypto work that I do, um, Check out consensus.net and metamask.io for uh, the world's leading Web3 wallet. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for coming out. This Thank was you. fun. Thank you. Well Thanks done, for Julie. Us. Thank you, Julie.